start anywhere and get anywhere, but be, be yourself, be authentic, make space for other people, especially other people who aren't like you. Even if you don't agree, you can still make space for somebody. Welcome to another power-packed episode of Builder 365, where we talk about the latest trends, insights, and strategies shaping the home building industry. And speaking of shaping the home building industry, I have with me today Shore Consulting Certified Trainer, Mary Beth Berry. Hi, Mary Beth. Hi, Amy. How are you today? Good. I'm so glad you were able to jump on. Glad to be here. Glad to be Looking here. Looking very fall. Yes, definitely. We both have our sweater weather on, so this is amazing. Best time. Yeah, I know it's not quite warm enough here to put on a sweater, so I'm just stuffing myself into it anyway. You know what? Do what you got to do. The sweater looks great on you. Do what you got to do. Well, listen, uh, Mary Beth, you know that I try to avoid running at all costs. I, I mean, even if something's chasing me and maybe not then, right? Like I try to maintain a sedentary lifestyle as much as possible. But you're training for a marathon right now, yes? So it's it's a half marathon. It's a half marathon. Well, it's but half it's, more than what I'm doing, so I'm impressed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's definitely a training process, though. So that is what I was wondering, right? Because you and I, we have similar schedules, and I, I'm looking at you. You got you got young kids. You're on the road all the time for work. Where the heck are you finding time to train? <laughs> um. You know, that question's really interesting, and I'll tell you, I believe that words have power. And so I've never been fond of the question, where do you find time or where do you make time? I'm a big believer, where do you prioritize your time? And actually, in this season of life, I am able to prioritize some extra time for fitness. When I am on the road, I'm not taking care of kids. So there's no reason why I don't have 30 minutes to an hour in the morning to work out. And on the weekends when I am with my family, there's no reason why I can't leave for an hour. So a typical half marathon training usually takes only about five hours of investment a week. So I'm able to prioritize those hours and get the goal done. It's impressive. It really is. So Thanks. when's the big day? It's going to be at the end of October. I want to say October ooh, 26th. Okay. Last weekend of October. All right. Okay. Well, I will be cheering you on from the couch, watching football, eating my snackies. Uh, <laughs> but in all seriousness, best of luck to you. It's really impressive. I can't wait to hear how it goes. I oh, appreciate that. Appreciate that for sure. Well, I want to give a special shout out to our partner for this podcast. Builder 365 is powered by Open Door Builders. Easy sales, smooth moves. You can learn more about the work they do to support home builders at opendoor.com backslash builder365. So Mary Beth, I was recently reading an article, as I know that both of us too, right? Try to stay up on what's being said right there, uh, right out, you know, when we talk about home building. Um, but they were talking about nine emerging home building trends, nine things that we're seeing more and more of. What are your guesses on some of the ones that might be on the list? So if I had to make guesses with affordability being at the forefront of everybody's mind in home building, I would say um, efficiency. Uh, and what I mean by that is footprints that aren't necessarily as large, but maybe rooms that can serve multiple purposes. So for example, my friends who are purchasing right now, they're like, I can make my home office and a guest room the same room and maybe even make that also a room for children's toys and storage too. Uh, so using rooms for multiple purposes, um, bold colors seem to be the thing right now. We just painted one of our walls in navy blue and I am obsessed with it. I love a bold accent wall. Uh, so maybe bold design trends uh, are out there. I'm seeing a lot of that on social. Um, yeah, and just, uh, you know, just, uh, oh, and I'd say low maintenance materials. People don't want to spend a lot of time on upkeep. So low maintenance materials outside the home and maybe inside the home too with countertops, flooring, things of that nature. Those would be my best guesses. I think you're really close. Um, and listen, I don't think some of these, like you said, are probably going to be too surprising. But the list said number one was finished engineered floors. Number two, like you were talking about, was mixed use spaces. But they were actually talking about mixed use spaces more of like a live, work, play community. Uh, right, so a little bit more environmentally around you, not just inside the home. 
Uh, the third one, and this kind of goes to your accent wall, they were talking about dopamine decor, which I'd never heard that phrase before. I thought it was interesting. But the home that serves as a haven for our mental health. So what makes you feel good? And it's funny you say Navy. Uh, I actually did my entire library. It's all dark Navy. It, it's so dark it almost looks black. And I ran it all the way through, even on the ceiling. So it is a full wall uh, room that encompasses you uh, in darkness, basically. But I love it. It's kind of moody. Um, number four, all electric homes. Number five, single story homes. Number six, family oriented spaces. Number seven, creativity and outdoor design. No more cookie cutter exteriors. Uh, eight, work from home spaces. Not surprising on that one. And number nine, outdoor retreats such as pools, pavilions with outdoor lounges, kitchens with retractable screens, and outdoor fireplaces. Do any of these matter to you? Yes, we just built a new fire pit in our backyard. So I was like, we need a better uh, space to hang out. And uh, when I started the project, I knew that Tucker would eventually get fed up and finish it. So we have built a fire pit. It's officially ready for fall. We got the twinkle lights, we got the surround. So yeah, all of these make sense for how people are liking to live. It's tracking. Are any of them on the list you're like, yeah, just not me. I'm not into that trend. I mean, I, I'm on board with all of those. You know, even if it's not my cup of tea, it's probably somebody else's. So nothing on there was was really surprising. But what about you? You seem to you you have really strong opinions on what you will and will not do. So I, I'm curious. What, what, <laughs> you have on there? known me for not a huge amount of time, but you really know me very well in the uh, relatively short amount of time that we've gotten close. Uh, yes, no, I do have strong feelings, of course. Uh, I'll I tell you the one on there that I'm just like, it's not for me. I get it. It's not for me. It's all electric. I, I love my gas stove. I do. Cooking gas to me is like the only way to go. I, I think I'll just like go down dying on that one. Uh, but the, all the other ones, I get it. I get it. And I'm buying an electric car. So listen, I'm doing my part on electric, right? But leave me my gas stove. Huh, cool. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, listen, we have another wonderful uh, guest for you today. I cannot wait for you to hear. In this episode, we are talking to Elena Money Garman, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Garmin Homes. She's a home builder, a writer, a speaker, and a mom. She's known for her award-winning blog, Build Like a Girl, and her passion for supporting women and marginalized people in home building. She also just won Woman of the Year in Residential Construction, and is just the most amazing person. Everyone take a listen to my friend, Elena Money Garman. Elena, thank you so much. I know that your schedule is going all over the place all the time with work and family and friends and all of your awards that you keep winning. And I mean, you're always somewhere. So, uh, so for you to take a little time with us is really appreciated. Thank you so much. Oh, that's a big honor and, and a big indulgence for me to get to talk to you. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've always been fascinated and you've always been very open about your journey to get where you are. I, I think, you know, some people look at you as a CEO and a business owner and they're just like, well, she just has always been that way, right? Like it's just always been this massive success and everything goes right and, you know, and all that. But and not that you didn't do things correctly, but you started on the sales floor. Yes. And like there's been a journey to get where you're at. So can you just sort of take us through your journey from, you know, sales representative all the way to owner and CEO of Garmin Homes? Yeah, sure. And before I was a sales rep, uh, I was in healthcare. My I had two degrees, um, a master's in, in healthcare administration, and I was a miserable healthcare consultant and found my way into new home sales. And that, I was on site for Dear Horton, and I sold a home for the first time, wrote a contract, and that was like, I don't know what doing drugs is like, but that must be close to that. And I have been chasing that sort of high, I guess, ever since. So that that sense of accomplishment and fulfillment, um, I was hooked from the very first. And I was on site for Dio Horton for a couple of years and then um, for Standard Pacific before it was Cal Atlantic and then yep. Lennar. Right before it was all the iterations, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, long, yep. long time ago. And I wanted to get into sales management, but I didn't want to do it in a large national um, home builder because my second daughter was very, very young. And I knew 
what those hours look like. Yeah. And Jim had started Garmin Homes in 2007, and I wanted to be part of starting something from nothing. I wanted to sort of get in on the ground floor of something and be able to grow my career along with the company. And it was 2008, really good year to start a company. A home yes, company. excellent, excellent. But could not have chosen a better year. Nailed it. I actually do think we nailed it, though, because we were broke. We didn't have any money, and everything was about to go on clearance. And we didn't have anything to <laughs> yeah. lose. Yeah. And so I, that's a double-edged sword, though. I feel... Um, I felt for those builders. That could have been us if we were, yeah. you know, if our timing had been two, three years before that. So, yeah, it worked my, worked myself to the bone. Yeah. To sort of wake up every day and breathe life into this company that I wanted to exist. Yeah. And so it was like one of those, um, those blow up, uh, those blow up things that people have at birthday parties for their kids. Like every morning I felt like Garmin Home was like, we had to like pump it up with air and like make it exist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and to be where we are today is, is an incredible testament, but a big turning point in my career was build like a girl, which is a blog I did in 2010 where I documented my process of learning how to build a home and being a construction manager on site, crossing over from sales to construction. And that has always been sort of my journey was to do a deep dive into something I didn't know about and then bring back those lessons to my core purpose and role and really enhance that role to have a broader point of view. And I think that broader point of view is what elevated me along the way as Garmin grew, my career grew. And I went from, you know, sales manager to uh, vice president of sales to division vice president where I was um, over construction and I was actually managing construction at one point and then I became a division president. And then once I became a division president, I had an ownership offer as part of my offer for division president. And that really was like the, the key to that division president role was being able to put lots on the ground in front of us. And I really tucked us right inside master plan communities where I, um, I knew I would learn from the other builders in there. I knew I would aspire to be best in class for that developer. And, um, yeah, that's, that's where we went. And then I, I needed a really fantastic operator to run the business and, and found that in Rebecca McAdoo. And she's, she's grown us to this level that is still unfathomable to me that we'll be, we'll be starting 400 homes this year. That's so wonderful. And I love yeah. Rebecca. So please tell her I said, hi, I will. I will. So, I mean, it's been like, you've really had to learn other parts of the business. Like you said, I mean, you, you came in from something else, you started in sales. Um, and I was actually talking with, uh, an executive, um, just the other day, a female executive. And that's what she was saying. I was like, well, how did you get where you're at? She just said, I said yes to everything. Like, I was like, yes, I'll learn that. Yes, I'll learn that. Yes, I'll learn that. And so I think that sometimes, right. That's what people don't really understand is they try to just stay in their lane and be excellent in their lane. But I don't know that that's going to get them to the high level executive positions because those positions have to understand a broader piece of the way that the company runs. Yes. And it sounds like you were doing the same thing. Like, yes, teach me how to build a home. Right. Yes. Teach me how land works. Yes. Teach me how to be a part of this master plan community. Absolutely. I am purchasing Jim's background. Um is purchasing and so that that marriage between sales and purchasing literally and figuratively is what enhanced the success of my career in Garmin Homes I I wholeheartedly believe and you're saying yes to the opportunity to learn and you're saying no when someone asks you if you know what you if you know everything about it I think it's that that leading with the vulnerability is a key component because you won't learn if you pretend that you already know and if you just sort of throw yourself at the mercy of whoever's in front of you willing to teach you, you will absorb more and you will let them build your perspective so you can, you can effectively lead while, you know, connecting dots between all the different departments within, within the, the home building company. Yeah. Cause there's a lot to know. I mean, and, and they're very, very different pieces too, and how they all come together and understanding that it's going to be critical. I think I'm always looking for that Venn diagram overlap between all the departments like that's where the magic is, that that part where I can find something that serves um, sales and construction. I can find something that serves purchasing and construction. So you're trying to build these bridges um, so that there is a lot more overlap and a lot less silo mentality. Well, I'm sure I've told you this before, but that I was your best secret stalker for years and years and years. 
Uh, it was always like, Elaine and Moni Garman. Uh, and then we finally got to meet each other when uh, IBS went virtual, right? When the world fell apart there. And uh, and I just remember texting you afterwards going, will you be my friend? Uh, and I'm pretty sure like that was pretty much verbatim the text. Will you be my friend? And uh, and then that really, you know, sort of, you know, connected us and you were so gracious and we've had wonderful conversations since. But that also was my very first exposure to Garmin Holmes and how Garmin Holmes just has a bit of a different philosophy. You run things different than other organizations, right? Like you said, you look to other people to learn, but you don't necessarily copy other people. You have, and Garmin has its own culture and its own approach, which has always been fascinating to me. Can you just sort of talk a little bit about what makes you different? Sure, sure, yeah. And it, there's been an evolution. And of course, when you said like, can, can will you be my friend? I was like, this is the coolest text ever, first of all. <laughs> Because it's hard to make friends in your 40s, so I it love is. that. Garmin has been different from the onset. So we started with these four Garmin differences. Um, and in order for me to sleep at night, those four Garmin differences have to be um, observable, demonstrable differences that I just don't talk about, but people can understand from seeing our actions, right? So we want to be we want to be not the people we say we are, but the people we actually are. Um, and that, that other people could tell me what the four Garmin differences are differences are based on what we've done. Um, but Garmin is very different. And at the beginning, there's been an evolution to this difference because at the beginning, it was just whatever the big builders were doing, I was going to swing the pendulum so far the other way. And then one builder, one time, um, a local builder who's very well respected said, I know they want to be different, but do they have to walk around with their middle fingers in the air all the time? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sounds like loser talk to me, but okay. That is Wow. He's a very, he's very successful and well-respected. And it was just, it sort of like broke this spell of like, okay, I can be self-aware and, mm -hmm. and understand that the difference can be meaningful and purposeful, but not just for the sake of being different. Right. 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 Because right. that's not going to sustain us over time. Right. And so we really have dug into what makes us different um, in all the ways. So our paperwork, like our, our, purchase agreement, you can read it and understand it. And it's, it's six pages and it takes 20 minutes. And so that's a huge difference from other builders. And it's written in plain language because I am adamant that all of our paperwork be empowering and engaging and entertaining and uplift people to the moment that they, um, of where they are in their lives. We want to celebrate this and people don't always move for good things. And uh, we want to meet them where they are and help elevate and and engage them in this in this milestone um the other part of that is this journey we've been on to be an anti-racist company and to really um, lean into inclusion in all of its forms and that to me means that you know it's not the big sweeping changes you make or the 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 classes you take which we've certainly done but it's these like very small actions and habits that we build to make people feel more invited to the experience, invited to our company. Um, one of the weirdest things I guess people would say is we don't use acronyms at all, ever. Like even in my job title, if I introduce myself, I have to say I'm the owner and chief executive officer. I don't say CEO. And the, the reason we don't do that is because acronyms are exclusionary language and that you, they assume that the other person knows what it is. It puts them in a in a power position where if they don't know what it is, then they're afraid to ask because they feel like, obviously, if you're using an acronym, I'm supposed to know this. And we just don't want to take that risk that someone knows what we're saying and they don't and they're afraid to ask. And so inclusion is this, all of these subtle ways um, that we can make people feel welcome. I've been on several, you know, industry um, webcasts and Zooms where all builders are referred to in the masculine pronoun. Right. Guys, the, my guys, these guys right. are doing this. And, right. And it is offensive to me, especially when I'm right there right. <laughs> as right. a builder. And so we've changed the way we, we reference our audiences. And I don't want the first, um, you know, person who has different pronouns to have to come in and teach Garmin Homes how to make them feel welcome. I want them to, to feel welcome. And to know that we are a place that um, that will embrace and celebrate them exactly as they arrive. And so 
inclusion for me is about so much more than what we say. It is these very subtle ways that we hope someone is being felt um, felt whole and, and, and perfect exactly as they are and, and invited to this experience and to this industry. We were missing so many marginalized voices in this industry. And, um, and I just, that, I want that to be my legacy. I want to bring more people into this industry and have their voices be elevated and amplified. If somebody's listening to this right now and they're like, we should do better at that. We have not traditionally done a good job. But I, you know, I look at there and say, there's not always a lot of resources. And what inclusion means is consistently changing, right? How people want to be treated or how they want to be addressed. I mean, this is not a stagnant thing. I mean, if we go through history, right, we, it's sort of cringy. Uh, what used to be acceptable to say versus what's acceptable now, uh, acceptable ways to act, to, to behave, to think, all of these different things. So if there's somebody listening to you right now and be like, I want to do that, but I just don't know how. How? Um, Tasha Jones from LV Jones Consulting. Call her. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> she, is, um, she is a powerhouse um, resource. She is a woman of color and she built this extraordinary business. Um, she worked at the neighborhood that was formerly known as Stapleton is now Central Park in Denver. And she has a business uh, as a consultant and she will teach you to, to see the bigger picture and to see what's, um, see what's inside of your company already and to understand diversity, equity, and inclusion um, from a broader perspective. And really teach us our own biases and, and understand how we can bridge these gaps that we have with, with other, uh, with marginalized voices within our, in our communities and in our industry. Cause I don't believe that we can be a great builder if we aren't fully reflecting the spectrum of buyers that we build for, you know, and I don't, I don't want someone to feel othered by the experience of building a garment home. And, but, I, I can't, re I can't recommend Tasha enough. That's great. Okay. That's a great resource to know. Um, well, you know, again, I just, I just applaud you for doing something different because we're not necessarily seeing it. I think that we get into the system of just doing things the way we've always done them, right? Thinking out of our history instead of our imagination. And I think that that's something that you've definitely brought to Garmin Homes is how to reimagine this and how, how does this become a company that you're proud of? to, uh, I will no longer call you the CEO. Uh, I will always call you the chief executive officer from now on. That was fascinating. I'd never thought of acronyms. That's, that's a, that's a really good one. Cause I do think when we think of inclusion, right, we, we think of that in a very narrow way yes. versus just like, do we have, you know, do we have a contract that people can actually read? You know, right. are we not using acronyms that, you know, can be exclusive to people if they don't understand? I mean, there's a lot more to this, right. Than mm -hmm. sometimes people boil it down to. I think it's the questions we ask each other too. Like, where did you go to school? You know, mm. one of my favorite parts of this industry is that you you don't have to have gone to college, right. a four year college, or where did right. you? You know, I think those questions make people feel othered, and it's right. it's just very simple ways of making people feel prepared and whole, and you know, wonderfully qualified to contribute to our industry. I love the word othered. I wrote that down. Um, so now if people hear this, they'll know it was your turn, but if they didn't hear this, then it can become my term. And then that will be wonderful. Uh, and you're like me, right? You got kids right now who are looking at colleges. And it's so funny because Claire, uh, my 16, she's 16 now. I can't even believe it. Right. She's, she's a sophomore, but she's been talking about colleges since she was in the eighth grade. And she's so obsessed. And I said, Claire, let me be really clear. Nobody has ever asked me where I went. Nobody. They've never said, where do you want, where'd you go to college? Nobody cares, especially in home building, right? People don't care where you went to college and they certainly don't care about your GPA. So I was like, Claire, you're going to be fine. Wherever you end up, it's going to be okay. Right. But I think we do, we get so obsessed. Unless you need a huge construction line and then they do care. <laughs> and then maybe they care. And then At maybe the very, they care. At the very, very top sometimes they, yeah. we have let it slip in the conversation that Jim went to Yale because <laughs> it. Just, Without. you know, casually throwing it out. He shows up, you know, with a flag and a sweatshirt and a bumper sticker. Okay, I got it. Really, really subtle. Okay, in perfect. certain areas, but not everywhere. Yeah, for the most <laughs> part. I tell my kids the same thing. I have two in college now, and I it, that it's to complete, not to compete. Right. You complete oh, I love that. your degree. You do that. You give 100% effort, and your effort will not always match the result, and that's okay. It's the effort that counts. The effort will always count, and you're never going to sit down to a test in your 
career. You're always going to have people that, that are nearby to help you and ask questions. Right. That's really good. That's a really good perspective. Uh, something else that I think is unique about Garmin is your dedication to innovation. Uh, I was speaking with uh, a group not too long ago about this idea of adaptability uh, and how adaptability really is its own form of intelligence and how well, not only do we adapt in the moment, but how well do we forecast changes and adapt in advance of those changes. And I'm looking at, you know, Garmin and I, I know I have like raved about this so many times, but I can't stop. Um, when we were going through the pandemic, there was the America at Home study, um, and right, you were the builder. There was an arch- there was research, there was architect, and then there was the builder. If I'm getting basically the pieces correct, right? So they did the research. The architect said, "Okay, here's what we here's what we saw. So here's what we need to do." And then you volunteered. You raised your hand and said, "We'll build that home." And there were just so many pieces of things that were in that home that were different. Uh, the family bathroom. I think there was a hidden study. Uh, drop-off zones, right? If you didn't want to have to interact with people. Uh, Zoom spaces. I mean, there were so many things there. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about innovation? Did any of those things stick? Um, or, or, you know, did, are any of those things that you brought forward or at least ideas or, you know, where does Garmin stand on innovation? Um, we, we, I loved that project for that reason. I wanted to build that home because I wanted the benefit of 7,000 consumer respondents. I'd never even built 7,000 homes with Garmin Homes. So <laughs> that, that intel, that data was gold, and I wanted yeah. to see it you know, brought to life. It, the, it's interesting. The, the pocket offices, yes, they have stuck because there's so much flexibility and work from home. And um, the family entrances... Uh, absolutely have stuck in terms of having the bathroom and the drop zone and a sink very nearby where you where you enter the home because our habits have changed post pandemic and and being aware of bringing the outside into your home um the package drop vestibule in the front of the home um hasn't been as explicit as it was in the um the american home but i i built one in my home i'll tell you that (laughs) yeah i love love it well i love it because it's charming in an old home sort of way and i love that that notion of separation of space of like sacred space within the home and then homes you know space within the home where you have other people come in and and see you but not necessarily come into the home right um i'm very protective of that that space and that that boundary is important to me it's interesting. The family bathroom makes so much more sense. And the family bathroom was, the concept was that for little kids, we put them in these shared, um, these shared bathrooms. And I'm not calling them what they used to be known as is yep. Jack and Jill's. And so yes. I don't gender rooms as much as possible right. um, in our rooms to leave space for people to decide who's who's using those rooms. But in this bathroom, these this shared bath space, it was a this this was a um, its own entity where it wasn't connected to the bedrooms, and it was a bigger space that allowed for not just the children but the caregivers as well, the adults. Because when you're in one of those tiny bathroom spaces that's connected between two bedrooms, it's enough for the children that are living in those rooms, but not the caregivers too. And we're, right. there are years there where you're just monitoring teeth brushing and and going to the bathroom and showering and. Not just letting the water run on you, and you know all those. You so all, yeah. All There's loops in there for a reason, right? Yeah, all those activities require a, adult intervention, and giving space to that just made so much more sense to us. But it's a deviation from the norm, and so people did not choose that, even though it makes a tremendous amount of sense. And I think part of that is just it's not what we're used to. Mm-hmm. And so, if you're not going to stay in that home for a long time, maybe your agent is telling you that that's that's different and Mm -hmm. so um different is bad until it's good until it's proved good yeah by a couple of risk takers so and it's an upgrade and we know what affordability housing affordability has done in the past couple years so on the list of things that that make the cut with the budget it's probably not one of them yeah yeah well, I'm glad you brought up the um, the housing crisis and the affordability crisis. We talk a lot about that on this podcast. And my hunch is that, that that would also be something near and dear to your heart is how are we providing affordable housing, right? How are we meeting the needs of our population? So what are your thoughts on that? I've been really fortunate to be asked by other uh, by people who are leading these affordable housing endeavors to participate. And I think if you care about the affordability 
and housing crisis, then you need to show up with your time, talent, treasure, one of one of them, two of them, three, all three, whatever it takes. I don't think, you know, just that there's this notion out there of like that um, there's no such thing as other people's children. Like every as a, as a mother, as a parent, you know, I there's no such concept of those are their children. I don't need to worry about them. This is nobody else's crisis. Like this is this is not just to the housing industry either. It's the local governments. It's the the towns. It's the um, the local heroes. It's it's everybody's problem to to try and solve to show up with whatever we have to give. So I was lucky enough to get asked by Tava Mahadevan to participate in his vision for the farm at Penny Lane, and you can look up the farm at Penny Lane on online. And it was this vision of a working farm with wraparound um, social services. He owns a nonprofit social services company called Cross Disability Services, and it's in partnership with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Social Work, where he was going to provide 15 tiny homes to people in, with serious mental illness. And this sort of like wraparound community model of giving people services to help them heal um, who are on a very fixed income, like $300 or less a month for housing. And he wanted five of them to go to victims of military sexual trauma. And he had seen our work um, building hero homes for Gold Star families. And so he reached out to me and asked me to build one home. And it was a, a he showed me um, uh, plans for this tiny home that were drawn pre-pandemic. And this was post-pandemic. And so he said, I have a $50,000 donation for all 15 of these homes, but I need I need 15 builders to build them. And he showed me the plans, and I said, um, this is not a $50,000 house. This is like a ninety dollars to $100,000 house. If you let me redesign this plan and it gets approved by the town, I'll build all 15 um, for 50, and I'll make them, I'll hold myself accountable to getting them to $50,000 to cover the cost. And, and we did it, and it was a great learning experience about you know, I think there's this notion of finish and feature in homes as quality. And that's a, that's a big disconnect for me because there is no less quality in those tiny homes than there is in my home that I built custom bespoke, you know, you know, there is no difference in quality that my home and that home are sacred spaces because of the people that get to be in those homes and heal from whatever traumas we all have because we all have them and so being part of that project really taught us how to approach the crisis really of mental health with our trade partners because you know we have to get the buy-in of our trade partners we couldn't build them the same way we couldn't pay them by square foot we had to maximize their time which is why i said i would do 15 and not one i can't pull my trade partner you know team off of an entire neighborhood to go somewhere and build one tiny home that's 416 square feet so you know, um, building the common space that we all share, the common ground that we all share, which is uh, suffering from something, needing to be housed. And um, everybody knows somebody who suffered from serious mental illness. And so our trade partners really rose to the task of, you know, showed up to the problem of affordable housing and said, yeah, let's build these. Let's, let's use this as a test case. And now it's being presented. There's a paper, uh, uh, an actual paper that um, is being presented at the public health conference in this fall in Minneapolis. And I think I'm going to go because it's kind of this full circle moment for me. Obviously, my background is in public health. And so we got to be part of it from a housing perspective. And it's not going to get better unless we all show up with our time, our talent, and our treasure. And um, I'm serving on that as a result of building those homes. I now serve on the housing advisory board from my town, which I applied to... Um, through the mayor, and um, and we're trying to look at opportunities to build more affordable homes while this town continues to be. It was on Money Magazine's top, you know, places to live in 2015. So it's skyrocketed in, in recent years. So there needs to be some intervention to get it, um, to make space for more than just the people who can pay the price. Yeah. Well, I think you take an interesting, you know, you talk very specifically about uh, mental, the the housing crisis with mental health and the, the mental, right, the housing crisis it, it spans. And I think this is important that you bring this up. It, it spans a variety of people, whether it be mental health or whether it be some sort of abuse or trauma or whether it simply be a fourth grade elementary teacher in Milwaukee 
who can't buy a home because their, you, you know, his or her income isn't going to be enough by themselves to afford a home. Right. So the affordability crisis, I think it's very rightly so you point out that there's a lot of different applications to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have to keep trying stuff to figure out what's going to work because what's going to work for us is not necessarily going to work somewhere else. And how, unless we keep trying, keep making these attempts and failing and then trying again, there's never going to be, there's never going to be a dent. And it's not up to anybody else. It's not up to our government. It's not up to any one person to solve. It's not to housing to solve or mortgage, you know, lenders. It's, it's up to all of us to, to contribute and to, to be thoughtful about it and, and compassionate because, yeah, sometimes, sometimes there just isn't enough money. Yeah. Well said. So, you know, you know, we're talking about that. I mean, there's so many things, right? As we look forward at home building and, and you're, you know, you did have a, you know, short uh, stint somewhere else, but then you, like me, are career home building. Uh, I certainly fell into this by accident, but could not imagine doing anything else. I love this industry so deeply, uh, and, and I wanted to be, I wanted to meet people where where, you, where they need to be met, just like what you're saying. But as I'm looking forward, I, I look at that as like the future is bright for home building uh, in so many different ways. How we can serve people, how we can innovate, you know, how we can uh, make things accessible and affordable. I mean, there's so many different things that I'm excited about. What are your thoughts or predictions for housing? I think there's a lot of white space out there to 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 get creative. I think a lot of home building companies rely on the big nationals to set the pace or the small customs to set the aesthetic or that, you know, the creativity. And it just really, I think we we learn so much from each other and see what that looks like for for each company you know what is the authentic version of if i was to try to be a little bit more creative in what i'm offering but also what are the lessons i can take from a large national company and the habits that i could build into my operation no matter what size i am to to further my you know my mission and i think you know our mission has always been more about change and making a dent in the universe you know we say we believe a home building company could change the world because that's the bar that we've set is wanting to do something meaningful. And I do, I think there's a lot of space to get creative if in, in certain places though, I don't, I think that, that in the big nationals, there will always be, you know, shareholders. I don't, I don't have, that. I don't have shareholders. I have my husband and my, you know, my angel investor and my my employees and, and all their families. I mean, those are my shareholders and, and my homeowners. And and I can make decisions with a lot more freedom than than other home builders can. Um so I think I'm I'm empowering other home builders like me to to find out what they want to do and then go do it. Just go try it and not, you know, not default to the to the way it's always been done. You know, not the pendulum swing of like, just because they do it this way, I want to do it differently. But what would, what could we do? How could we explore something new? Like the American Home Study, it was, you know, how can we take where people are right now in their homes and, and take these lessons and put them into our plans and put them into our thought process as we design homes? How can we design for not just the, the great milestones, but the, but the crises as well and the unexpected things that happen in our lives that, that turn our, turn our lives upside down inside our homes. How does our home rise up to meet us in that? You know, that's the question I'm asking when, when we're designing product, it's like who lives here and how many different people can live here? And what if something goes wrong and how does this space transform to, you know, as the family ages or as the family dynamic changes, you know, how, how does the house adapt? And so that long lens view, I think is definitely going to help us build better homes over time. Yeah. I mean, we're definitely rethinking that right now in our 200 year old home. We don't have a, a true guest bedroom and we certainly don't have a true bedroom on the main level. And we have aging parents and, you know, we're both the oldest child, which means we're going to get them and we're not ready. I mean, we're going to go ahead. We've actually already started drawing the plans to anticipate that because you're not going to get a lot of notice, right? When your family changes, you're going to have to make that change really quickly. So, no, I think that you're right. Is right, How does the home live now, but how does it adapt to changing lifestyles over the course? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. 
Um, well, listen, if the audience haven't, hasn't picked it up now, uh, they can see, I'm sure, how inspirational you are. You've been certainly inspirational to me. You always give me the best advice in a new perspective in the nicest way possible, right? I don't think you've ever been like, I'm sorry, why would you think that? Like, that is terrible. Uh, you've always come at it with this kindness in your heart, which I appreciate because I know some of the times I'm like, I say something, you're like, no, no, that's not, that's not the right way. Uh, but, you know, as, a, as I'm sure we have people listening that are brand new in this industry and they're li listening to you and they're like, this is fantastic. I love this. What advice would you give for new people in the home building industry as they are developing their careers? You, you can, so I did a, um, I did an impromptu graduation speech on my Instagram um, in May because I'm surrounded, my kids are, you know, 14 to 20. And so I'm surrounded by these new graduates and, and, high, and high school and college. And my number one piece of advice is you can start anywhere and get anywhere and the effort that you put in, the the creativity, the compassion that you bring to problem solving and um, the vulnerability to ask questions and ask for feedback. You know, how could I, what did I miss? How could I do that better? And really being receptive and open to that, that coaching is critical, I think. And, and when, when there's a ceiling that is shorter than where you want to get in your career, you will have to make a move. The, the days of staying at a company for 20 years um, may not be realistic and may not match what you chose at 24, 25, 30, 35, 40, may not match the decision you make later in your life. You know, give yourself permission to change your mind. And if, you need, if that means changing companies or changing careers, then go do that. Um, and, and, and do it scared. It, it, that's what it feels like. That, that is, that is what it feels like. That is normal to be scared. I, I am scared a lot and I, I do it scared because I know that the more I do it, the less scared I'll be. And I, when I can't do it for myself, I picture my daughters. I picture Rebecca's daughter, who's going to be a woman of color. I picture marginalized voices. I picture my, my gay children, my straight children, you know, how are we making a way for more people, um, to walk through the door with their head held high and their back straight and shake somebody's hand and tell them who they are. That's, that's what's important. So start anywhere and get anywhere, but be, be yourself, be authentic, make space for other people, especially other people who aren't like you. Even if you don't agree, you can still make space for somebody. Well, I could certainly sit here and talk to you for hours. And maybe I'm about to say, uh, let's just stay on. We're going to end the podcast, uh, but we'll just go ahead and keep talking. But Elena, thank you so much. I love your unique, fresh perspective. Um, you always have amazing and wonderful things to say and new ideas and just maybe a little different approach. And you're unapologetic about that. And I've always really admired you. So thank you so much for being on. Oh, thank you for having me. What a, what a thrill. So Mary Beth, I mean, you know, I of course had the privilege of talking with her firsthand, but you got a chance to view that. What'd you think? What were your takeaways? Oh my goodness. So many takeaways. That woman is absolutely amazing. Uh, someone really inspiring for sure. Okay. I think my top, mm, top two takeaways is one, you can get coaching on how to be more inclusive. There's just so much that we don't think about on the day-to-day -day basis. Acronyms like CEO, seriously? I th thought that was really cool and insightful. And then also having uh, your product reflect the buyer and not the builder. I thought that was really cool. Speak buyer, not builder is definitely going into my list of phrases. Uh, that I'm going to use, but uh, making the rooms more gender neutral or not, not, um, what, how did she say it? Uh, basically not the Jack and Jill or the team of guys. I thought that was just really insightful and cool. Uh, so yeah, she's amazing. I love Garmin Homes. She is. I, I could, I could talk with her for hours. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Please tune in for our next one. We're excited to see you back. Everyone, thank you so much. We'll see you next time.